Welcome Divonauts to Cronista de Indias, the YouTube channel dedicated to Latin American studies by Dr. Andrea Lorena Fernandez. Follow us on Instagram at Cronista de Indias for more cultural content. I am still at Baruch College waiting to teach my next class, which is perfect time to record. Uh, I made it into an empty classroom, which is a glorious opportunity to be alone and be quiet. I'm making two episodes in one day, so I just put on my jacket back on because I get a little cold and I also wanted to make it different from the previous episode. And in that same line, I changed orientations beforehand. I was at the window. Now I am. I discovered that I can project on the, on the screen, so we got Frida uh, back there as my spare animal for the afternoon. Uh, uh, that's actually the PowerPoint from for the next lesson, so lesson three. Uh, in the previous episode, episode 19, we talked about Clorinda Mato de Turner and Indigenismo in Birds Without a Nest, a novel from 1889. We talked about Indigenismo, Gamonalismo, Positivism, Social Darwinism, and the Peruvian Republic. In Birds Without a Nest, Clorinda Mato de Turner uh, uh, is framed in the context of the War of the Pacific from 1879 to 18, uh, 1883. Uh, we talked about the indigenous community of the fictional Sierra village of Quijac, anti-clericalism and the abuse of Catholic clergy towards the natives. We talked also about the Criolla woman as an intermediary between government and social justice and why Clorinda was exiled and excommunicated for her orphan discourse in this indigenista novel. Actually, the first indigenista novel, the movement peaks in the 20s and 30s of the last century. In this present episode, episode 20, yay, finally episode 20, we titled it La de Pelonas or Chicas Modernas from 1900 to 1959. We characterize the third unit of the course of Latin American divas for the first half of the 20th century in the present episode. And we're going to have two sections. Section one, we're going to talk about Latin American feminisms, first and second waves. Uh, this is going to have three sections before 18. Uh, 1880s, between 1880s and 1900s, and from 1900 to 1959. The second section is going to talk about the interbellum, or the period between World War I and World War II, the Mexican Revolution, and the Pelona, Chicas Modernas, and changes in femininity. The characteristics and tensions of the Perona, Pelonas or Chicas Modernas is the last section of the episode. So let's get to it. Uh, first wave and second wave feminism. So this is about the transition between the first wave, which is about finding ways to make it into college and have higher education, and second wave, which is characterized by the access to the ballot or suffrage. So in the 1880s, we characterize feminism of, uh, with solitude or small groups. The women we have studied up until now in Cronista de Indias have acted alone, meaning their influence is limited within their lifetimes, though we admire them in retrospect. You gotta think of La Pola or Manuela Sáenz, who acted as individuals, but a movement necessitates a group, and for that, you get to the 20th century. The cult of motherhood or the family unit is actually prolonged into the 20th century. Think about how the romantic like Gertrudis Gomez de Avellaneda and Clorinda Mato Turner advocated for Afro and indigenous groups using Marianismo and the Republican motherhood as tools of negotiation. We begin to see in the 1880s literacy and domestic skills as insurance. You gotta see the episode on Josefa Acevedo Gomez on cleanliness is her motto. This is insurance against civil war and the fact that men are dropping dead like flies because of war, so women have to fend for themselves as mothers and widows. So they see literacy and domestic skills as insurance for that. We are still equating motherhood with womanhood as though having a, ki a kid defines your femininity. That is not the case, by the way, but for the 19th and early 20th century, that is the case. In the next section, 1800, uh, from 1880 to 1900, we begin to see the nascent organized social feminism or women's organizations or conferences. Uh, once again, we see literacy as insurance. We begin to have wage labor, so girls are getting out of the house and into the factory. Uh, this feminism is characterized by middle and upper class women which who are safeguarding morality. You gotta think of the uh, the prohibitionists of the 1920s in the United States. They were these were mostly women who were worried about men men's abuse when they got a little bit too drunk, or actually far far too drunk. Uh, this middle and upper class feminists see mother, uh, feminists see motherhood and womanhood as an equation. They 
do activism that is maternalist and they the, their purpose is to serve the greater good, not necessarily themselves. They're still using the rhetoric of motherhood. They avoided questioning gender roles and they expanded the influence from whom to work. Uh, we see a tension between women's social uh, limited social roles, rights, and status versus progress and inclusion in the urban workforce. This is thanks to industrialization, increased government jobs like secretaries, nurses, teachers. European immigrants mean that we have more urban workers in urban Latin America. We expand public education, meaning that women can become uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors, engineers, and including vocational schools, which means a bigger audience for feminism, especially the first wave. So first wave feminism may be summarized in the following. It is urban, it is working class, literate, radio, telephone, pink literature, meaning magazines like uh, the grandmother of Cosmo, uh, and class struggle versus less is fair or hands off government. The third, uh, the third periodization we're going to do is 1900 to 1959, where we continue to trend to, towards women's organization, conferences, we seek equality in marriage and family, education and work become just as important, we seek equal pay and suffrage and protection from labor abuse. So here is the lineup. So uh, in terms of who got to the ballot box first, Ecuador, you win from 1929. So yay, Ecuador, you win at being the first to grant um, women the right to vote. Next are Brazil and Uruguay in 1932, Cuba in, 19, in 1934, El Salvador 1939, Dominican Republic 1942, Guatemala and Panama 1945, Argentina and Venezuela 1947, Chile 1949, Costa Rica also 1949, Haiti 1950, Bolivia, 1952, Mexico, 1953, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Peru, you go together, 1955, Colombia, why are you so late, Colombia, 1957, Paraguay, you're even later than Colombia, 1961, though the bulk of these uh, enfranchisements happens during the 1940s, during World War II, when the United States and Europe are distracted with the war, so that uh, Latin America gets a boost in industrialization, more factories means more, more girls outside, more girls outside of the house means more activists that want to vote. So that is the easy explanation. In the, from the 1900 to 1959, we begin to see a trend of motherhood being optional. For example, my spare animal back here, Fia Kahlo, and her sister, Eva Peron, neither of them were mothers, and yet they were still considered part of uh, uh, the women's movement uh, in the, the early 20th century. And we begin to see a trend towards self-fulfillment self and the greater good. Not so much the greater good, but now we're trying to satisfy ourselves as women uh, in the early 20th century. Think of Frida Kahlo, it's totally self-satisfaction. Self -satisfaction. Uh, the second part we're going to talk about is the interbellum, or the period between World War I and World War II, in which we have the Mexican Revolution and the emergence of the Pelona. And I've fail to specify what pelona means. It means no hair, meaning that you're cutting your hair gradually shorter and shorter. Think of the flappers. That will be the style. And this represents changes in femininity of the chicas modernas or the the modern girls. So we can actually mark this in Latin America with the Mexican Constitution of 1917. Although not all of us got to sh not all of us got to share the 1917 Constitution, it inspired constitutions in neighboring countries. So we can mark it as um, one of those periods. We and setting continental standards. So for example, the Mexican Constitution grants one month of hard work exception uh, exemption. Uh, postpartum. That was brand new. Uh, do, I mean, even in the United States, you don't get one month off, and they got it in uh, 1917. They thought this was, should have been part of the law. Uh, presumably, we're, uh, ladies are getting equality under the law, child custody, uh, female holders of ejidos or small, small land grants uh, are expropriated during this time, so that's not so good. Uh, restricted women's employment to dangerous industries and after 10 p.m. And uh, limited the workday for women to eight hours. So it's a tug of war. It was a negotiation. 
But the important thing is that we get farm girls and immigrant girls are moving into the city and becoming the urban proletariat. Uh, and they are mobilized by railroads, cars, war, cinema, radio, and eventually television. Some of the things that they're into that their mothers and grandmothers had never seen before. Store-bought makeup. Mm. You can buy this at the drugstore now. Dancing, dating, wearing no corset. Yay for that. No corset. Bathing suits, sports, cosmopolitan girlfriends, radionovelas, short hair, and even shorter hemlines. It's, this is like your ankle showing. It's not a miniskirt. Uh, I should clarify that. Uh, so the experimental womanhood of the 1920s is influenced by flappers, as I said, shorter hemlines, uh, jazz, Wall Street, cigarettes, Hollywood, telegrams, railroad correspondence, and international travel. These are the products of the suffragists and the soldaderas legacy. So we're going to talk about suffragists and soldaderas in the next couple of episodes. And some of the products, are, um, some of the examples of this time period are, are uh, Maria Bella Ramirez, Ernestina Lopez, Gabriela Mistral, Nelly Campobello, Eva Perón, Frida Kahlo, Okay. Uh, Dolores del Rio, Maria Felix, Rosario Castellanos, Patria Minerva, Maria Teresa, and Dede Mirabal. The characteristics and tensions of the Pelonas and Chicas Modernas are attacking Victorian and Marianista sexuality. Male artists feel threatened and tend to reduce the suffragista or soldadera to controllable archetypes of virgin whore or mother. The wartime machismo of the revolution, like the Mexican Revolution, later on the Cuban Revolution, suffocates the suffragista and soldadera's potential feminism and portrays them as the archetypes of femininity. So, for example, Diego Rivera represents men as conquerors and women as fertility in his paintings at the National Palace. Some suffragistas and soldaderas never return to skirts, they stick to pants, and popular culture constructs their male personas. Um, Women begin to demand more rights than ever before. So in the 19th century, we just wanted to go to college, but when we went to college, once we went to college, ah, it was over. Patriarchy, you are going out. Women only strikes against high rent, for example. They demand more religious tolerance, for example, for the Jews fleeing Europe during World War II. Vocational schools extend ed women's education into practical arenas. An extension of male privilege like Hey, uh, health and education for families, and the Ministry of Public Assistance, for example, these type of entities, Ministry of Public Assistance, take care of child rearing and entitled women uh, as social workers. So you begin to get the idea of the social worker. So aside from the teacher, the nurse, uh, and um, the secretary, the secretary, you get the social worker, a new role that women can fill in which their professional, uh, their professional training becomes socially useful. Secular women's organizations like women's rights and women band together in factories, dance halls and demonstrations and build solid solidarity around, yes, once again, characters like the Virgin of Guadalupe and Santa Rosa de Lima and La Virgen del Coromoto, yes, they're still religious figures, but women are banding together in larger and larger groups. Uh, they faced resistance from conservative women. This was not a unified movement. Las Damas Católicas campaigned to ban birth control, divorce, photography, and cinema, for example. The press ridiculed chicas modernas as pelonas, meaning bald, because their haircuts and were just like bobs and pixies in the 20s. Uh, we experienced university gender violence. Country girls who aspire to the middle class through education threaten class and gender boundaries. And in the USA, we have jazz, Wall Street, and Jewish quarters, which we try to imitate in Latin America. We see it in film, so we want it, we want it as well. Conservatives assassinated progressives on occasion, so violence against women was common. Uh, well, on, on occasion, uh, the, the violence was common, but assassinations were on occasion. Men used the law and romantic law, love, to replace wives. Machismo told on the modern woman means subservience, depression caught between motherhood and ungrateful men. In the 1940s, across Latin America, we get a tension between maternalism and mestizaje. So let's do maternalism first. 
motherhood becomes a space of resistance to the state's patriarchal discourse. So we're still using motherhood to advance ourselves socially. Catholic women support reopening the churches in the 1930s and oppose sex education. Their daughters uh, in the uh, 50s, 60s, and later on in the 70s support liberation theology. A Christian movement or a Catholic uh, offshoot movement where uh, you exalt Christ's poverty, therefore we, su we should focus on social programs as good Catholics. Mestizaje, or mixing of um, races in Latin America, has been there since the colonial period. Just check back the previous 20 episodes and you'll get it. Uh, this means institutionalized racism. So transnational media consumerism distances cities from rural areas. And if you take a look at women's magazines during the 40s, what you see is the criolla and the mestiza is not represented. Not even today. It's very, very rare to see a mestiza woman represented on like the cover of like Vanity Fair uh, Latin America. Commercial beauty culture. Uh, as opposed to the Indians, uh, the Native American and the Afro-Latinas body type and uh, physiognomy. Indigenous and Afro-Latina America becomes static versus uh, the magazine female and urban masculinity. So you don't see representation in film, even though they are um, everywhere, everywhere, um, especially in the, in the Caribbean. Um, and in Andean and Central America. So rural women join the Catholic Marxist labor organizations. That's actually going to be very important for getting suffrage. Uh, in conclusion, episode 20 of Latin American Divas, the present episode, we titled Las Pelonas or Chicas Modernas, 1900 to 1959, and we characterized the third unit of the course of Latin American Divas in the first half of the 20th century. We divided first and second wave feminism as a transitional period between 1800s uh, also, uh, sorry, 1880s, step one, 1880s to 1900s, and 1900s to 1959. The interbellum, or period between World War I and World War II, saw the Mexican Revolution and the emergence of a new kind of femininity centered around the pelona, or the short hair girl. And lastly, we talked about tensions between chicas modernas and chicas conservadoras. So the conservative women opposing uh, the, new, the emergence of this new type of femininity. In the next episode, episode 21, we're going to talk about the suffragists, uh, Maria Bella Ramirez and Ernestina Lopez, going back to the Southern Cone. These ladies are respectively from Uruguay and, uh, and Argentina. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about Latin American divas right here at Cronista de Indias, where new episodes drop, drop whenever I find an empty classroom uh, that I can record in and I have time between classes. Please hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And as always, thank you so much for viewing, liking, sharing the episodes. Last but not least, our motto, hashtag do epic shit.